Hello, everyone. Um, uh, immediate, my immediate feelings are one of being a fraud because I ne never actually studied permaculture. And I'm giving a talk at a permaculture conference. But I've done all these other things. But uh, I suppose I've done self-directed study on permaculture. So, uh, I have um, some permaculture courses come to visit me. And I've had permaculture um, volunteers on my garden. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't feel that much of a fraud, I suppose. So my talk is on, uh, oh, excuse me, the Garden of Complete Being. And I suppose, um, well, I'll just unfold that as I go. I haven't actually written anything out, so um, I'm relying on getting into a state of flow to uh, that all my material comes out in a poetic and clear way. So it just feels to me that we live in these really interesting times um, there's big changes upon us. And um, this is a bit of a cliche now, but there's this Chinese uh, term for change, which includes these two components, which danger and opportunity. And uh, I'm sure we can all feel that. And I think my message to everybody uh, is that, um, well, to explore what the opportunities are at this time. To me, it just feels like things are so... Um, uh, uh, the changes that are bearing down upon us are so extreme that we have nothing to lose by doing what we need to do. And just to get out there and, um, uh, well, I call it, let's make paradise. Let's just make paradise in response to these, uh, the situation that confronts us. And I suppose this is very much the, um, the inspiration that lies behind my own project, is to uh, try and reimagine what the world could look by, like uh, uh, outside of this existing paradigm and to give other people an example of what might be possible. Because um, if I make paradise and everybody else in this room makes paradise, we start to encourage other people that it might be possible for them as well. And I've had some very encouraging news recently. I, I go to quite a few festivals and talk about forest gardening. And um, I've had a few emails recently from people who are saying, hey, you know what, I heard your talk um, at this festival and... Um, you really made me see it was possible to do this. And we've actually just gone out and bought four acres of land or whatever. A few people have said that. So I've been felt very encouraged to get that, uh, to get that feedback. So I guess, yeah, this is the question of, um, well, what kind of changes uh, could we make? And I, I think I've kind of already covered that, at least from my point of view. Um, we can really let our imaginations uh, rip and actually just ask ourselves, what kind of world would I like to live in? And, you know, I can't change the world. I can't change the world. But I can maybe change, you know, an acre or half an acre or I can change my back garden into an example to other people of what, what we can do. So just to show, live by example, uh, live by the world we would like to live in, to make that world and to invite other people to come and share that world with us. Uh, and I find this, this turns uh, into a very inspiring opportunity. Uh, rather than feeling overwhelmed and feeling powerless, I can't do anything. And um, I can just assure you from my own experience, people get a huge amount of inspiration from seeing uh, you know, inspiring responses to these difficult situations. Here, yeah, I'm just uh, telling you what I've just told you. <laughs> um, yeah, so don't focus on what's wrong, but just see what you can do with what you've got, whatever resources you've got. Uh, just by, try and make a change from, uh, from that place. Um, yeah, to reimagine what it means to be a human being on this uh, limited pl planet. So uh, I find this is a really uh, important issue. Um, and for me... It's reimagining what it means to be human on a kind of philosophical level. It's like, for me, as I've done this project, I really start to feel uh, the incredible abundance that nature offers us. We've been, give, we've been given from nature, you could say from Gaia, if you want to anthropomorphize it somewhat, but we're given it the air that we breathe, we're given the water that we eat, all the food that we eat, it, pass, it comes into us, passes through us, and uh, Guy has kind of given us all this without charge. 
and we give it away again. So um, it seems like the universe is really one of generosity. It comes to us, through us, and then in a way it's our responsibility to be generous and pass it back. And I feel that uh, as a response to this generosity that we receive, an attitude that's really important for me is one of generosity, or of, of gratitude, to feel grateful for this abundance that nature bestows upon us. And um, I think without this um, attitude of gratitude, it's kind of a relationship of exploitation. Uh, so this is becoming more and more important for me to try and uh, cultivate this attitude of, of gratitude. Okay, so th I, uh, I visited Bali in my early 20s and it, it changed my life in many ways and I, I could be here for hours talking about how it changed me but I've only got 15 minutes probably. Yeah, <laughs> I've got less, okay. So uh, I can imagine what this per uh, person is doing. Oh, what's happened? Hey? Oh, okay, so uh, this is uh, someone in a field making an offering in Bali, and this is this feeling of gratitude. She, I feel that uh, uh, she's placing herself in relationship to the world that's around her in an in a attitude of gratitude, gratitude. Okay. So, for me, another motivation is Buddhism and ecology. There's lots of um, correlations, I feel, between the two. And one is of uh, this interconnection between things. Now, the trouble is, unless uh, we have the right mental states, we don't actually perceive these interconnections. It's just a, a conceptual idea. Uh, and I think Buddhism and the idea of meditation, we start to actually have the mental states where we see the interconnections between things. And... Um, I've noticed in my own project, when things go wrong, it's often because I haven't, had, I haven't seen the interconnections and therefore um, I've, I've missed something and something's gone wrong. And so for me, uh, making a forest garden is a kind of spiritual practice demanding me to see and perceive and experience uh, the interconnected nature of, of the world. Okay, I'm going to rush on a bit. I'll, t I'll talk it through. Okay, so my project is a three-acre forest garden, which started as a bare, empty field. So I've got a, a bit of an iconic slide of, uh, imagine a gate stretching behind it as a three-acre field with absolutely nothing on it but grass, a grass paddock. And um, uh, so there was this delightful, kind of agonizing, blank canvas experience of, well, what do we do with this um, blank field? And uh, <clears throat> so... My design process is by one of conversation, by just uh, allowing myself not to know. Like, you know, we have a conversation. We don't have an idea of how the conversation's going to flow. So um, starting with the bare field, the first thing we did was plant out a green manure of the Hungarian ryegrass, which grows about eight foot tall. So that was for the first two years. And the best yield that this provided, other than all the organic matter that it sequestered in the ground, was that it gave time. It gave time to imagine a design that was inspiring. So what happened was we started by, um, we made some earth banks using a digger first up, and these banks were maybe about this high. And immediately we noticed after the, um, the last frost of the year, very hot, hard frost behind and no frost in front. And just by the simple act, we were able to extend the growing season. And this led to an idea of creating earth banks throughout the whole property. So we've got all these circular south-facing uh, banks that um, capture the sun and make these much warmer microclimates. However, they don't only just do that, they create outdoor living rooms, these sort of much smaller spaces which divide up what was a flat field into these earth bank surrounded spaces uh, that make it very intimate. And then that invites a journey through the landscape that's rather circuitous, and it feels like you're walking through a labyrinth, uh, a labyrinthine journey. And so people come there and they think, is this 10 acres? Or, and I say, no, it's three. It's, they think it's much, much bigger than it actually is. Uh, and it creates this kind of intimacy to the environment, which is uh, very enjoyable. Now, right in the centre of, it's basically a triangular-shaped piece of land, and right in the centre of that piece of land, we've made a natural swimming pond, which is about, probably about the size of the space in here. And it's totally surrounded by earth banks. 
So it's all the earthworks that came out of the pond, surround the, the, the pond. And these earth banks create much bigger warm microclimates. They're about nine foot tall, these banks. And uh, we make alcoves into the banks, line them with rocks. Uh, so in the summertime, the water temperature in the pond is about 20 to 24 degrees, constantly radiating day and night. And this warms the microclimate around the pond. Now, I don't know if any of you have research the sort of plants you can grow in this country, but um, a lot of them are quite marginal for this climate. So um, if you can nudge the temperature by a degree or two, uh, well, each degree you raise the temperature, it's equivalent to going 300 miles further south. So two degrees, 600 miles. I haven't actually done the research yet, but it's just anecdotally, you know, it feels like another season when you walk into this area around the pond. So that we are starting to grow really quite interesting Plants, and I don't know how successful they'll be. Actually, just coming here today, uh, on the bus uh, near where I, my friend's place where I was staying, I saw a banana tree. And guess what? There were bananas growing on the banana tree in London. Isn't that cool? Um, and so my guiding star for microclimates is, I don't know if you know it, but the um, most northerly growing grapefruit uh, in the world is in the Chelsea Physic Garden. So people go into the Chelsea Physic Garden and they see grapefruit hanging off the trees. So it's possible to grow grapefruit in this climate. But you know, all you need to do is how much energy you're willing to do into manipulating the, uh, the microclimate. So um, at how, how much? Five minutes. Five minutes, cool. No problem. <laughs> nice. Uh, so at last count, we had, um, well, I stopped counting at 500 different species. So I guess we're doing quite well on the uh, diversity front stakes. But I reckon probably up to 650 now, edible and useful plants. Um, and I haven't even started on the ground cover yet, well, only in small places. Uh, this year, we've got absolutely tons of yield, just like I've got branches breaking on the boughs because they've got so laden. And I believe this is because uh, I took the trouble to put the um, green manure into the ground. And I think what we've got happening is uh, huge populations of the mycorrhiza under the ground. And I'd read this phenomena, the sort of lift off you get at a certain point when the mycorrhizal fungi have kind of linked up to all the trees and the plants. And I kind of, you, you know, I look at the plants and they sort of, it seems unfeasible how, how you know, the vigour that are behind them. And uh, like blackberries, just like absolutely thousands of blackberries on one branch. So anything that's yielded this year, this year, so we're in the fifth year now. Um, I've just been very, very impressed with the, with the yields that I've been getting. I don't know if it's just particular year or whatever, but um, I've, been, I've been astonished, actually. Um, so, yeah, I suppose really um, my, the forest garden I've made, it's not just about growing food. Uh, and I'm nicking this from Embercoon, but it's, you know, it's about growing people, actually. And um, I guess I'm focused on this idea of thinking about what other needs we have as human beings. It's not just physical needs that we have. We have all these other needs. Maslow's hierarchy, it was on one of the slides. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs where we need, uh, yes, we need our physical bodies and our physical needs need to be met. But we also have emotional needs and needs for beauty, uh, needs for community, needs for uh, spiritual uplift, if you see what I mean. If all those needs are met in the environments that we live in, I think a lot of the problems that we face would disappear. Perhaps we wouldn't need to have consumerism. You know, if we actually felt full and nourished and complete beings, we, we may not need to have this strange paradigm we've got now, which is like tries to make us feel empty so that we have to fill that emptiness of buying stuff. Um, and anecdotally, by the visitors that I ha have, I can just say that they come and they go, well, they might leave again. They say, I feel I've been on retreat. I've been here for a day. It feels like I've been here a month. So time does funny things in, this, in, in the garden. So um, anyway, you can see I could go on and on, but that gives you a flavour of my garden. And it's called the East Devon Forest Garden, and you can look me up on Facebook. And I'm always happy to have uh, volunteers. My plans for the future are to start running courses based on this idea of uh, the garden of complete being. So yes, I will be teaching about forest gardening, but I also want to run retreats. Um, I also want to run... I'm a photographer, so I can run photography courses um, and things like this. So like, we cover the whole spectrum of our lives 
exploring how we can deepen and feel nourished in all these different ways and make our own contribution to, to making the world a better place, even if it's only on three acres. And then people can go out and spread that, spread that message. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right, so that uh, we have some time for questions. So, um, anybody questions? Is there? Uh huh. Yes. Okay. Where can I find pictures of your bags? You can find them on my Facebook page. Oh. Facebook page, uh, East Devon Forest Garden, you can find it. But I think you live in Axminster, is that right? Tring. Tring, yeah. So um, you can come and visit. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry about the technical hitches in this presentation. Kind of there's, uh, yeah, PowerPoint and Open Office don't like talking to each other. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Uh, just a more, more statement. I'm uh, from the south of France, so uh, we have uh, the climate you have now uh, in your garden, I think. Yeah. And uh, we uh, actually, uh, I made also a pond myself. I did uh, about the same project as you, not in this extent, but you know, m on my scale. And I have an Inulara semosa, that's a plant from the Himalayas, who grown in the wild near my pond. So maybe we can exchange some plants. That'd just be lovely. Suggestion. Okay. I'd appreciate that. Thank Good. you. So what was this? Was, what was the plant you? An Inulara Simosa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions over here? Um, in your aquaculture, I mean, I'm sorry, in your pond, are you also uh, doing any kind of fish species in there? And is this project uh, more for personal enrichment, or are you um, also looking, uh, do you sell to any markets out of your, uh, your system? Okay, so first question is, um, uh, what was the first question? <laughs> no, we don't have fish because um, basically it's kind of like a recreational place. Uh, not just recreation, actually, it's the social heart of the garden. In my research for forest gardening, the, the gardens that are the most successful are the ones that people really most want to, like happy hanging out in, as it were. And um, I can tell you that people come to the pond and they just never leave, leave and they bear for hours on end. And uh, it really draws people into the garden. And I can really see what a difference that has made. Um, if I had fish in it, you wouldn't really be able to swim in it. Okay, so that's the first thing. And then, um, basically, I'm, I'm a one-man band, and I'm managing a three-acre site, and I've got um, a health issue, which really prohibits me from, you know, farming it, actually. So that's why I'm, I'm designing myself a role which can continue into the future, which is being teacher. And hopefully other people will come in and perhaps take on those other there's an opportunity for other people to take up those other possibilities. So I'm not discounting that, but um, not really part of what's going. But in the pond, I am growing uh, quite a few edible species of plants, which, which is interesting. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? Um, up there. As, a, as a manager, um, how many do you get to work on the land? I mean, do you find that you need quite a lot of people to look after that tree? Um, so the question is like, how many people, like, how much effort yeah. do you put in? How yeah. many people does it take? Okay, I'm 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 in year five now, so like I've completed the development works pretty much, and I could get away now with just um, mowing it once every two weeks. So I could kind of be there on my own, but it's not much fun. So uh, uh, I actually really just enjoy pe having people in, uh, just to be there and to have to actually watch them. Well, not to watch them, but to participate with them sort of like on a journey of discovery. That's what I'm really enjoying, actually. So I'm, I've got, often got people there not because I need them, but because it's just it's a shame for the garden not to be used in that way. Yeah. Charmian from Cornwall. Um, you said you've got something like 600 plus species. Can you tell me what sort of sources you've used for those and whether you've done it from seed and with yeah. nurseries yeah. or whether you've purchased the actual plants or what? I've done every possible way. Basically, I made a hit list of the things I wanted to have in there and then uh, just went out finding them in one way or the other. So using that um, Royal Horticultural Society plant search, uh, on eBay, worldwide seed searches, 
I propagated stuff, I bought it, I've imported stuff, um, you name it, I've done it. You know, so basically I've just hunted stuff down wherever I can find it. Or, or swapped stuff with friends, that's another way. Yeah. Um, I've got a question. Yep. Um, and without going um, you know, into your personal details too much, but kind of, yeah, kind of like, uh, I'm quite interested in that designing with health in mind. Yeah. And kind of, uh, especially uh, people kind of are growing older or yeah. people with particular health conditions. Kind of what sort of considerations would you say kind of go into that? Uh, well, I, I guess it's, it's a conversational approach that I've got, and I guess I've got an open question. I don't have answers, but um, because I do have these health issues, I've kind of realised I've still got really the lower layers of my forest garden to develop, and, and I feel I've kind of done my bit, and I think, well, hey, here's an opportunity to um, collaborate with uh, other people. So, like, well, could I not invite a um, herbalist to come in and just take on the whole of that design of that layer. And that could be a business for them within the overall thing. So I'm trying to think of this way to, um, well, acknowledge that I've got limitations, but actually to use it as a possibility for forging new kinds of relationships. And perfect. so I don't, the funny thing is this garden has never had a purpose at the beginning other than just, oh, I want to do something really lyrical in response to the problems. And you see what I'm saying? You sort of write, okay, yeah, I've got health issue. I can't do this, I can't do that, but what can I do? If that makes sense. Oh, thank you, yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, more questions from the audience? Um, over there, yeah, Joe. Joe from Canterbury. Yeah. Hi, I'm, what's your favorite plant in the garden? Oh gosh, uh, my favorite plant. Mm. I'm having to think. Well, I've just discovered this. In fact, I can't remember the name of it, which is embarrassing. But um, it's a water plant, which has the flavour of um, uh, lemon, uh, orange rind, or orange zest. And it's quite an intense flavour. Does anyone know what it is? I've forgotten. Yeah, so. Um, and it, it's just fabulous in a salad. It's just like, on its own, it's too much, but you put it in a salad and it just brings a salad alive and makes it the most amazing experience. So that's my favorite new discovery. <laughs> is it the fish mint, Vietnamese? I can't hear you. Is it the Vietnamese fish mint? Is it that one? It's a, a marginal plant. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. really pretty. Yeah, it is. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Vietnamese fish mint, is that right? Okay, um, so yeah. um, there's more, another question there? Yeah, maybe even two. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Paul uh, from the Seattle area in the US. Um, we have bumped into a lot of problems with uh, spacing of trees, and I was wondering what your take on that is, and then you also yeah. mentioned mowing, yeah. and I was wondering if you have found any successful strategies for competing with running grasses and sort of yeah. their attempts to thwart uh, other plantings. Yeah. Okay. Just remind me the first question again. First one, uh, spacing on oh, yeah. trees and such. Yeah. So what I did, I've got, I've got big boards, which you would have seen on the slide, but you've got to uh -huh. imagine it. Meter size boards, which are a scale model of my site. And then I, on my list of hit list of plants, I then made uh, circles of the diameter of their maximum size mm -hmm. and then, uh, pin them on the board. Uh, with the correct spacings in mind. And uh, I kept redoing it and redoing it again and again. So that's the first thing. Oh. And secondly, after my green manure, what I did is I planted a, um, a transitional ground cover of nutrient recycling plants. Uh, it's a mixture that you can buy here in this country. And uh, what I've discovered is if you plant it very thickly, it, it suppresses a lot of the grasses. Uh, in fact, there's some areas where actually there's a bit of bare soil, that, you know, nothing's got, got in the way. And, and these nutrient cyclers, obviously when you're mowing around the trees with a side delivery mower, you, you're adding organic matter, you're adding the mineralized clippings, you're keeping the moisture in, uh, and all these different effects, and you're you know, suppressing these uh, vigorous grasses. So I'd really recommend to do that any, to anybody. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you. Last question over there. My name is Vala from Iceland. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, you said that you grew Hungarian ryegrass. Was that all over the garden? It was, yes. For two years, and then you yeah. mowed it into the yeah, soil? Yeah, that's it. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, and so, so there were no plants in the garden, or did you take them out, or? Did I what? Sorry. W were there no plants as when you started? No, there were, but we, yeah. we did actually plough it for one. It's three acre site, so we did get it ploughed for one last time. And which take, obviously you took away all the plants that were there and planted yeah. right across. Yeah, but. Okay. Um, you know the, the benefits of that have been astonishing, I would say. But but did you did you uh, compost it first, or uh, I, I I then rotivated and then planted the um, nutrient recyclers. Yeah. Right, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I'm afraid that's all we've got time for, and so we'll have another changeover. And yes, yeah, so again, feel free to talk to your neighbours. And so, what did you learn here, kind of for your own site, maybe, or things you're working with? Uh, yeah, what questions arise there for your own work as well from this presentation? I'll just say I'm really glad that slides weren't there so you were able to use your imaginations.